Quattro. There is a time in the last few days of summer when the ripeness of autumn fills the air and time is quiet and mellow. I live that time fully, strangely aware of a new world opening up and taking shape for me. In the mornings before it was too hot, Ultima and I walked in the hills of the Ayano, gathering the wild herbs and roots for her medicines. We roamed the entire countryside up and down the river. I carried a small shovel with which to dig, and she carried a gunny sack in which to gather our magic harvest. Aye, she would cry when she spotted a plant or root she needed. What luck we are in today to find la yerba del manso. Then she would lead me to the plant her owl eyes had found and ask me to observe where the plant grew and how its leaves looked. Now touch it, she would say. The leaves were smooth and light green. For Ultima, even the plants had a spirit. And before I dug, she made me speak to the plant and tell it why we pulled it from its home in the earth. You that grow well here in the Arroyo, by the dampness of the river, we lift you to make good medicine. Ultima intoned softly, and I found myself repeating after her. Then I would carefully dig out the plant, taking care not to let the steel of the shovel touch the tender roots. Of all the plants we gathered, none was endowed with so much magic as the yerba del manso. It could cure burns, sores, piles, colic in babies, bleeding dysentery, and even rheumatism. I knew this plant from long ago because my mother, who was surely not a curandera, often used it. Altima's soft hands would carefully lift the plant and examine it. She would take a pinch and taste its quality. Then she took the same pinch and put it into a little black bag tied to a sash around her waist. She told me that the dry contents of the bag contained a pinch of every plant she had ever gathered since, since she began her training as a curandera many years ago. Long ago, she would smile, long before you were a dream, long before the train came to Las Pastoras, before the Lunas came to their valley, before the great Coronado built his bridge. Then her voice would trail off, and my thoughts would be lost in the labyrinth of a time and history I did not know. We wandered on and found some oregano, and we gathered plenty because this was not only a cure for coughs and fever, but a spice my mother used for beans and meat. We were also lucky to find some osha, because this plant grows better in the mountains. It's like la yerba del manso, a cure for everything. It cures coughs or colds, cuts and bruises, rheumatism, and stomach troubles. And my father once said the old sheep herders used to keep it used it to keep poisonous snakes away from their bedrolls by sprinkling them with osha powder. It was with a mixture of osha that Ultima washed my face and arms and feet the night Lupita was killed. In the hills, Ultima was happy. There was a nobility to her walk that lent a grace to the small figure. I watched her carefully and imitated her walk. And when I did, I found that I was no longer lost in the enormous landscape of hills and sky. I was a very important part of the teeming life of the Ayano and the river. Mira, que suerte tunas, Altima cried with joy and pointed to the ripe red prickly pears of the Nopal. Run and gather some and we will eat them in the shade of the by the river. I ran to the cactus and gathered a shovel full of the succulent seedy pears. Then we sat in the shade of the alamos of the river and peeled the tunas very carefully because even on their skin, they have fuzz spots that make your fingers and tongue itch. We sat and ate and felt refreshed. The river was silent and brooding. The presence was watching over us. I wondered about Lupito's soul. It is almost time to go to my uncle's farms in El Puerto and gather the harvest, I said. I, Ultima nodded, and looked to the south. Do you know my uncles, the Lunas? I asked. Of course, child, she replied. Your grandfather and I are old friends. I know his sons. I lived in El Puerto many years ago. Ultima, I asked. Why are they so strange and quiet? And why are my father's people so loud and wild? She answered. It is the blood of the Lunas to be quiet. For only a quiet man can learn the secrets of the earth that are necessary for planting. They are quiet like the moon, 
and it is the blood of the Marez to be wild, like the ocean from which they take their name, and the spaces of the Ayano that have become their home. I waited, then said, Now we have come to live near the river, and yet near the Ayano. I love them both, and yet I am of neither. I wonder which life I will choose. Ah, he, Hijito, she chuckled. Do not trouble yourself with those thoughts. You have plenty of time to find yourself. But I am growing, I said. Every day I grow older. True, she replied softly. She understood that as I grew, I would have to choose to be my mother's priest or my father's son. We were silent for a long time, lost in memories that the murmur of the morning wind carried across the treetops. Cotton from the trees drifted lazily into the heavy air. The silence spoke not with harsh words, but softly to the rhythm of our blood. What is it? I asked, for I was still afraid. It is the presence of the river, Ultima answered. I held my breath and looked at the giant gnarled cottonwood trees that surrounded us. Somewhere a bird cried, and up on the hill the tinkling sound of a cowbell rang. The presence was immense, lifeless, yet throbbing with its secret message. Can it speak? I asked and drew closer to Ultima. If you listen carefully, she whispered. Can you speak to it? I asked as the whirling, haunting sound touched us. Aye, my child. Ultima smiled and touched my head. You want to know so much. And the presence was gone. Come, it is time to start homeward. She rose and with the sack over her shoulder hobbled up the hill. I followed. I knew that if she did not answer my question that that part of life was not ready to reveal it was not yet ready to reveal itself to me but i was no longer afraid of the presence of the river we circled homeward on the way back we found some manzanilla manzanilla ultima told me that when my brother leon was born that his molera was sunken in and that she had cur cured him with manzanilla she spoke to me of the common herbs and medicines we shared with the Indians of the Rio del Norte. She spoke of the ancient medicines of the other tribes, the Azteca, the Aztecas, Mayas, and even those in the old, old country, the Moors. But I did not listen. I was thinking of my brothers, Leon and Andrew and Eugene. When we arrived home, we put the plants on the roof of the kitchen shed of the chicken shed to dry in the white sun. I placed small rocks on them so the wind wouldn't blow them away. There were some plants that Ultima could not obtain on the Iano or the river, but many people came to seek cures from her, and they brought in exchange other herbs and roots. Especially prized were those plants that were from the mountains. When we had finished, we went in to eat. The hot beans flavored the chicos and green chili were, were muy sabrosos. I was so hungry that I ate three whole tortillas. My mother was a good cook, and we were happy as we ate. Ultima told her of the oregano we found, and that pleased her. The time of the harvest is here, she said. It is time to go to my brother's farms. Juan has sent word that they are expecting us. Every autumn, we made a pilgrimage to El Puerto, where my grandfather and uncles lived. There we helped gather the harvest and brought my mother's share home with us. He says there is much corn, and I such sweet corn my brother's raised, she went on. And there is plenty of red chile for making ristras and fruit. Ay, the apples of the lunas are known throughout the state. My mother was very proud of her brothers, and when she started talking, she went on and on. Ultima nodded cur courteously, but I slipped out of the kitchen. The day was warm at noonday, not lazy and droning like July, but mellow with late August. I went to Hison's house, and we played together all afternoon. We talked about Lupita's death, but I did not tell Hison what I had seen. Then I went to the river and cut the tall green alfalfa that grew wild and carried the bundle home so that I could have a few days of food laid in for the rabbits. Late in the afternoon... My father came whistling up the goat path, striding home from the flaming orange sun, and we ran to meet him. Cabritos, he called. Cabroncitos. And he swung Teresa and Deborah on his shoulders while I walked beside him carrying his lunch pail. 
After supper, we always prayed the rosary. The dishes were quickly done, when then we gathered in the sala where my mother kept her altar. My mother had be- had a beautiful statue of La-, La Virgen de Guadalupe. It was nearly two feet high. She was dressed in a long, flowering blue gown, and she stood on the horned moon. About her feet were the winged heads of angels, the babies of limbo, the babes of limbo. She wore a crown on her head because she was the queen of heaven. There was no one I loved more than the virgin. We all knew the story of how the virgin had presented herself to the little Indian boy in Mexico and about the miracles she had wrought. My mother said the virgin was the saint of our land, and although there were many other good saints, I loved none as dearly as the virgin. It was hard to say the rosary because you had to kneel for as long as the prayers lasted, but I did not mind because while my mother prayed, I fastened my eyes on the statue of the virgin until I thought that I was looking at a real person, the mother of God, the last relief of all sinners. God was not always forgiving. He made laws to follow, and if you broke them, you were punished. The virgin always forgave. God had power. He spoke and the thunder echoed through the skies. The virgin was full of a quiet, peaceful love. My mother lit the candles for the brown Madonna and we knelt. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, she began. He created you. He could strike you dead. God moved the hands that killed Lupito. Hail Mary, full of grace. But he was a giant man and she was a woman. She could go to him and ask him to forgive you. Her voice was sweet and gentle, and with the help of her son, they could persuade the powerful father to change his mind. On one of the virgin's feet, there was a place where the plaster had chipped and exposed the pure white plaster. Her soul was without blemish. She had been born without sin. The rest of us were born steeped in sin, the sin of our fathers that baptism and confirmation began to wash away. But it was not until communion, it was not until we finally took God into our mouth and swallowed him, that we were free of that sin and free of the punishment of hell. My mother and Ultima sang some prayers, part of a novena we had promised for the safe delivery of my brothers. It was sad to hear their plaintive voices in that candlelit room. And when the praying was finally done, my mother arose and kissed the virgin's feet, then blew out the candles. We walked out of La Sala, rubbing our stiff knees. The candlewick smoke lingered like incense in the dark room. I trudged up the steps to my room. The song of Ultima's owl quickly brought sleep and my dreams. Virgin de Guadalupe, I heard my mother cry, return my sons to me. Your sons will return safely, a gentle voice answered. Mother of God, make my fourth son a priest. And I saw the virgin draped in the gown of night, standing on the bright horned moon of autumn. And she was in mourning for the fourth son. Mother of God, I screamed in the dark. Then I felt Ultima's hand on my forehead, and I could sleep again.